Hello, this is economics class once again. I hope everyone is keeping yourselves fine. Listen, in this session, we will discuss chapter 10. Chapter 10, it talks about government budget and it's very lengthy. I'm telling you, it's very lengthy. Uh, we are in no position to finish this, uh, finish this chapter 10, but we will try to cover those portions which I think is important. And at the same time, uh, we will try to explain uh, in brief as much as possible understood so you know before we go into your textbook there is this thing called planning or uh, a scheme to achieve certain specified targets or objectives in the government level also uh, before before uh, uh, before the end of the session you know the government makes a lot of plan as to where to make uh, their expenditure, uh, routine public works like construction of roads, highways, canals, schools, sanitation, uh, health, so and so forth. There are so many ways where government spends money for the welfare of the people. But before they do, they always make a plan. Where should we spend for the coming year? In Kohima, uh, you know, uh, the roads are a little small, so how do we uh, spend money in order to uh, to make the roads bigger? Or maybe uh, in places uh, in places like uh, remote areas, since development has not reached all those, how do we reach development in those areas? They always make a plan, or not? And most of the people in India depends their livelihood on agriculture. Okay, this year, how much should we invest? on development of agriculture or you know a tertiary sector it can be any forms of services uh, telecommunications uh, restaurants banking corporate hotels so and so forth these are uh, the major contributor to our national income so uh, this year how much should we spend for improving all these uh, uh, areas where I have just mentioned. So they always make a plan. After making a plan, their next step is, okay, where do we generate income? From where do we get this money or revenue to fund the expenditures that we have already planned? Getting the point or not? So before the start of the year, the government always makes a plan as to where to spend and at the same time, how to organize money or income to fund this expenditure. This is technically termed as government budget. Understood? And therefore, for one mark, a government budget is an annual financial statement of estimated revenue and estimated expenditure during a fiscal year. Are you giving the point or not? So I am just talking about estimation. The government has not spent yet. The government has not recovered the money yet. It's just an estimation. That's why government budget simply means an annual financial statement of estimated revenue and estimated expenditure during a fiscal year. What is a fiscal year? You know, in India, our fiscal year starts on 1st April. All right, normally we say financial year or not. I'm sure you, you must have heard your parents or maybe the elders saying financial year. And during the financial year period, people get busy, especially those people who go to office, especially in the end, uh, uh, during the time of March, because they have to make a conclusion. So in India, fiscal year starts on 1st April and it ends in the next year of 31st March or not. So this fiscal year, it is different in different countries. Suppose I have written on the board in USA, the fiscal year starts on 1st October and ends on 30th September. We don't apply this in India because in India, fiscal year starts on 1st April and ends in, sorry, on 31st March in the next year. All right, getting the point or not. So this is the fiscal year or financial year period. And now I want us to discuss on the objectives of government budget. When you go to higher classes, the objectives of government budget, you will have to go through numbers and number of uh, pages. But luckily in class 12, they have identified, they have identified the five most important ones. So the first objective of government budget is 
reallocation of resources. The government always have to come up with new ideas in order to reallocate their resources so that social and economic justice is ensured to all the people in the country. All right, and in order to achieve this, we have two important uh, measures. Number one, taxes and subsidies. And number two, uh, government's direct participation in the production activities. So what happens under taxes is, uh, you know, to achieve uh, reallocation of resources, heavy taxation can be enforced on the production of harmful commodities. Listen very carefully. Heavy taxation can be imposed on the production of harmful products like liquor commodities, like cigarettes, like tobacco, and all those products which are harmful for the good health of the people. So the government can start raising or increasing the taxation on the production of, uh, of all those products that harms the good health of the people. Not only that, you know, in order to encourage the people uh, to use uh, uh, products which is produced in our local economy, you know, today because of this pandemic, people have started rejecting the goods which is produced by China. In such situation, even in India, we have to produce our own domestic products or not. So in order to encourage all these uh, uh, products which is used by the masses and in order to encourage domestic production, subsidies can also be introduced for those production units which produces goods and it is used by the masses in the domestic country. In India, have you heard Khati? Khati and handloom industries, I'm sure you must have heard or not. Handloom and Khati is very popular in India. So that is one example given in your textbook. In order to encourage more production, subsidies can be introduced. Getting the point or not? Not only that, there are places where the, you know, uh, there are places where uh, which is considered undeveloped or underdeveloped. Technically, we say backward areas. So in order to encourage the development of these backward areas, the government can start introducing tax concessions on those investors or on those production units who are making investment in backward areas. So if the investors who are making investment in backward areas gets a tax concession, it will encourage the producers to invest even more and therefore slowly and gradually backward areas or underdeveloped areas will also come up. That will, uh, that will help us to fulfill the objective of reallocation of resources. So number one, heavy taxation can be imposed on those harmful products. Subsidies can be given on those, uh, those production units which produce goods uh, used by the masses, handloom or khati, and then your tax concessions can be given to those industries who invest in backward areas. Number two, not only this, government can also straight away, you know, participate in the uh, production of goods and services because of uh, what we normally call, because of um, uh, low profit estimation or because of low profit expectation, there are some areas where private entrepreneurs are not willing to invest. That you have to remember. Okay, so, you know, initially, uh, number of schools uh, in the country was also very less because schools were considered uh, not very profitable by the entrepreneurs. Health, sanitation, so and so forth. These are some areas where private investors were not willing to invest initially, but because of competition today, when you look around, we have large enough numbers of private schools, we have enough numbers of hospitals and uh, dispensaries, uh, I mean health services, so and so forth. But back in the day, you know, uh, it was very less. 
And so what did the government do? The government will also enter the market and they'll, they'll apply direct participation in the production process. That's the reason today there are a large number of uh, government-run schools already set up. There are a large number of uh, government-run hospitals being set up, so and so forth or not. So when this is done slowly and gradually, uh, we will be, the government will be able to achieve reallocation of resources. Then number two, we have reduction in inequalities of income and wealth. Everybody talks about a reduction in the uh, inequalities of income and wealth. The rich are getting richer, becoming richer, the poor are becoming poorer or not. Since, uh, since the day we got independence in India, the objective, primary objective of the planners, of the government, is to remove these inequalities. You know, even today we suffer uh, we we ha we suffered uh, we are suffering from this or not so the one of the objectives of government budget is to reduce these inequalities how let us follow your textbook so you know uh, uh, in order to achieve this reduction in inequalities of income and wealth the best thing the government should do is to uh, impose higher taxations on the income of the rich people. You have to listen very carefully. In India, just a handful of the people are very rich. Majority of the people in India are considered middle income earning people and the rest very poor. So in order to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor, what should the government do? According to their objective, the government should start imposing higher taxations on the income of the rich people. That's number one. Not only that, the government can also resort to imposing higher taxations on the goods and services consumed by the rich people. It's interesting or not. So the primary target of the government is the rich people. So the first thing is they can raise the taxations on the income of the rich people. Next one is they can start raising the taxation on the goods and services consumed by the rich people. Luxurious cars, number one, luxurious buildings, so and so forth. So when large or higher taxation is imposed on these rich people, the money so generated can be used for the, for the betterment of the poor people or not. So free education is given to the, uh, to the poor people, free health facilities is given to the poor people, free sanitation is given to the, uh, to the poor people. Not only that, there are many schemes uh, which, you know, uh, gives welfare for the poor people in the country. Where does the government get this money? By taxing more on the rich people. Getting the point or not? So when government starts increasing uh, their, their expenditure on providing free school, free education, education, so and so forth, slowly and gradually, the standard of living of the poor people will also rise. So when the standard of living of the poor people rises, the gap, the inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth will be, you know, will slowly go away. So these are just theoretical concepts, but in practical life, I am not sure if it's happening or not. But if these are done in the best possible manner, I am sure inequalities will go down. So number three, we have economic or price stability. What is economic stability? It simply means absence of large or big fluctuations of prices in the country. Small fluctuations of prices is always negligible. And in fact, if there is a moderate rise in price, investors or the business people are, you know, are benefited. Even consumers like you and I, if the rise in price is moderate, then we don't mind. But too much fluctuations and large fluctuations, it affects the economy or not. It comes under inflation. And therefore, what does the government do? The government should always be careful about these large fluctuations, big fluctuations, to ensure price stability in the economy. In times of inflation, the government should make sure that they reduce their public expenditure. The, in times of inflation, the government ensures that uh, all forms of public works development, uh, all forms of expenditure made by the government should be reduced. You follow your textbook. Then another one is, not only that, 
in times of depression or in times of recession, the government should introduce uh, a reduction of taxes and at the same time giving subsidies to the sick industries or giving subsidies to the people who needs in order to increase their demand. Are you getting the point or not? So in times of inflation also too much rise in price. In times of depression also there is uh, too less in demand. Prices are falling and it affects the economy in both the ways. So government should ensure that in times of inflation they reduce their expenditure on all forms of public works and at the same time in times of depression or recession they should reduce the taxation and start giving more subsidies to the people and when that is applied slowly and gradually the objective of budget is ensured then economic growth we have already discussed is simply increase or sustained continuous increase in the real gdp of the country or it simply means increase in the uh, in the in the quantity increase in the quantity of availability of goods and services in the economy and to ensure this the government uses revenue policy the government uses expenditure policy and then lastly we have management of public enterprises so there are some uh, areas where uh, no other private investors are allowed to invest those are called national monopoly i'll cite one example you know uh, uh, railways. Railways in India, no matter how rich you are as a private individual, you are not allowed to invest or not. Railways is totally uh, 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 a sector which is run by the government. Then uh, power generation, water supply, these are, all, these are all run by the government. So government, uh, they finance, they manage all these uh, industries so that uh, it gives welfare to the people. So the main objectives of government budget is to ensure all these things that I have already mentioned. Understood? Then we have budget receipts. What is budget receipts? It's very simple. I'm telling you, uh, these are just budget. These are just estimation. We have not spent yet. We have not uh, received the money yet. So even here also budget receipts, it simply means uh, money uh, money receipts from all sources by the government is simply called budget receipts. Or if we, we want to follow your textbook, it simply means uh, government receipts or government money from all sources will be technically called budget receipts. So this budget receipts is categorized into revenue receipts and capital receipts. What is revenue receipts? The money, uh, the money uh, that is expected to receive by the government from taxation and non-taxation. That is technically called uh, revenue receipts. Understood? But it, its its technical meaning is it's very interesting. Money receipts or estimated money receipts by the government, which does not create any liability, and at the same time which does not lead to reduction in assets is technically called revenue receipts. I'm repeating, please listen very carefully. Revenue receipts, the money uh, that is expected to be received by the government, which does not create any liability. No burden is, uh, no burden is uh, made when the government is expected to receive money. At the same time, no asset, is, no asset of the government is wasted when they're expected to receive money. That is technically called revenue receipts. Understood? Capital receipts, the money uh, receipts, which either creates a liability and at the same time, uh, which, uh, which loses uh, what we call assets of the government. That will be called capital receipts. So, these are just opposite. Over here, it does not lead to creation of any asset. It does also not lead to wastage of, sorry, it does not lead to creation of any liability. It does not lead to creation of any assets. Oh. Over here, it leads to creation of liability. At the same time, it will also lead to, uh, to wastage or maybe uh, lose, lose, loses what we call government assets. Getting the point or not? So, budget 
receipts, it is divided into revenue receipts and capital receipts. Later on, this revenue receipts is divided into tax and non-tax, so many which we will explain only in the next session. With this, I conclude my session. Thank you.